one is to look at one is to look at something called as Stokes Stokes Einstein relation. Um, this is applicable to something called as Brownian particles. Okay, as I was mentioning in the previous class, this is one of the widely used relationship for uh, or relation for finding out particle size data. Okay, if you want, if you have a particle dispersed in a fluid, if you want to measure its diffusivity or if you want to measure its particle size, okay, this is one of the widely used relation. Okay, we are going to talk something about uh, forces. Okay. Uh, which basically refers to if you have a particle and in a fluid and if you set it to motion, okay, uh, motion of a particle in a fluid to what is called as forces and uh, you can set a particle into motion by using external field, right. And either you could use something called as a concentration gradients, okay, or you could use thermal field or thermal gradient or I can use some other force, okay. It could be electrical forces, you know, or or magnetic forces, right. So, if you if you set the particle into motion by using, you know, by exploiting the concentration gradient, this is something called as a, a diffuser forces, okay. If you use thermal fields, something called as thermophoresis. Okay, and if you use electrical field, it's what is called as a electrophoresis, right? Okay, so we're going to look at some aspects of you know forces. Okay, this is what is going to be um, the plan for today. Um, so I'm just going to start by showing you again a movie which I showed in the last class. Okay, so this is. What has been done is that you know uh, the white dots that you see, these are particles, okay. These are something called as fluorescent particles, okay. Uh, when people use fluorescent particles, the idea is that if you use a, a regular optical microscope, okay, which works by using the white light, you can see objects up to about a micrometer or larger, okay. Of course, you can also look at things that are smaller than micrometer, but you can't resolve it, okay. You can't get a, a good um, um, image by using optical microscope. What people do is they use fluorescent particles, okay, by which I can actually push the limit of microscopy. I can also look at things that are much smaller than a micrometer size. You can even look at things that are 200 nanometers, 300 nanometers, okay. So this is sub micrometer particle and these are fluorescent particles. and and uh, white dots, as I said, these are spherical particles dispersed in a fluid. Nothing is being done. All that is done is you are just putting the particles in the fluid and you are just watching, you know, with a microscope, okay. And what you see is that particles are moving, right. This is without the influence of any external force. They are just moving by themselves, okay. And uh, if you can see, uh, there is no particular direction in which the particles move, right. They are just moving chaotically, okay. Uh, and that is because, okay, so you have molecules of the fluid around each of these particles and there is a, a bombardment of the fluid molecules with the particle, okay. And depending upon the bombardment, it will just move in some random direction, okay. It could be in x, y, z, any direction, okay. Now, such a chaotic motion, okay, is something called as Brownian motion, right? Okay, such a, um, a chaotic motion, okay, um, such a motion, which is because of bombardment of particles okay with the molecules of the fluid 
okay, is what is called as a Brownian motion. Okay. So, the particles really do not move in any particular direction, okay. this is a random motion okay, which is purely existing because there are molecules and atoms that constitute the fluid in which these particles are dispersed. Okay. Now, from yesterday's lecture we know that whenever we have a, a relative motion between the particle and the fluid, okay, there is going to be something called as a, a drag force. right? Okay. We also said it is also called as frictional force, okay. you can also call it as hydrodynamic drag force. right? Now, um, <coughs> so you can think about of course, we already know what this hydrodynamic force is right. Yesterday we already wrote up an expression for it right. But the other way of thinking about this uh, you know drag force is going to be you can actually bring in the concept of friction factor. Okay. Um, so, in this case C D is something called as was that? No? Oh, okay. Okay, C D is something called as a drag coefficient and it is defined something like this. Okay. Drag force divided by some area over density times some velocity head. Do you recognize this formula? some similarity that you may have seen in the previous lectures. So, if you look at this carefully, this is of the form your friction factor you know was something like wall shear stress divided by you know some velocity square right that is some, something like that right that is what it was. It was density okay, multiplied by the velocity head and there was a wall shear stress. Okay. Now, your shear stress is actually force per unit area right so f in this is what is called as a, a drag force and your ap is something called as a projected area okay and this projected area what is what is being done is if you have a, a spherical particle okay if it is that is fixed fixed in space and if there's a, a liquid moving over it okay now what you do is you look in the direction perpendicular to the flow okay what is that area that you see okay if you have a spherical particle if i look perpendicular to the flow what i would see is a, a circle right so your ap is going to be area of the the circle that you see that is your projected area okay and of course rho is the density of the fluid and u naught is the velocity with which your particle is moving in the fluid okay now, a lot of people have done. So now, again, we did this calculation yesterday. If you take the Reynolds number for the particle, we said you know it's going to be a diameter of the particle times some average velocity, okay, times rho, the density of the fluid divided by mu, right? And it turns out that because of the the particle dimension that we are working with, this is going to be much much less than one, right? Yesterday we calculated this is going to be of the order of 10 power minus 6. Okay. Now, whenever you are working under conditions where the Reynolds numbers are much much less than 1, we said that comes into some kind of a low Reynolds number flows or the lamina flows. right? And people have done lot of experiments and they have found that the C D for the Reynolds number much much less than 1 goes as 24 divided by the Reynolds number. Okay. Now, what I can do is I can take this relationship okay, and substitute for C D in this equation. I know what is the, the average velocity, okay. I know what is rho and as I said your A p is the projected area which is you know pi r p square. If you substitute that 
can you just let me know what your F D is? Can you just do this simple math? So, you substitute for C D as 24 by Reynolds number and Reynolds number is given by this okay. and so your A P is pi R P square or if you want to you know is pi D P square by 4 right. Okay, if you do that, can you guys let me know what F D is? right. So, you basically recover back the Stokes law right that is what we had done right. Now, if um, this is your velocity with which the particle is moving ok. If I know what is the average displacement ok over time is what you your average velocity right. Now, I have a movie in which the particles are moving ok. I can track you know the particles in every frame of the video I can get their location ok and therefore, I have a way of calculating what is the average displacement of the particle ok per unit time is going to give me what is the velocity with which the particles are moving right. Now, if you if I want to calculate ok what is so now that I know that there is a particle that is moving there is a drag force. So, I want to calculate what is the energy that is required to move the particle ok. So, how do I calculate that? I want to calculate what is the energy that is required to move the particle. right. So, the the work that has to be done for moving the particle or the energy that is required to move the particle is essentially your F d times x bar right your force multiplied by distance and we know that you know it is moving it has moved an average distance x bar. Now, so this energy that is required to move the particle where does it come from? it comes from the thermal energy right your K B T. So, we said that you know the reason why the particles are moving is because the solvent molecules are hitting the particle ok and why do solvent molecules are hitting the particle because your fluid is at a is at a finite temperature ok. Whenever you have a, a finite temperature, so you are going to have every molecule is going to be associated with the energy which is given by Boltzmann constant times your temperature ok. Therefore, your the energy that is required to move the particle which is F d times x bar actually comes from the thermal energy ok. Now, what I can do is I can substitute for F d is 6 pi mu u naught is x bar divided by T ok times R p times x bar is equal to k b t right. I can rearrange this and I can write it as x bar square by time is equal to k b t divided by 6 pi mu r p right yeah. And this is d which is the diffusivity of the particles in the fluid ok and it, sh it should have dimensions of meter square by time right meter square per second ok. Therefore, your diffusivity of the particle 
is equal to k b t divided by 6 pi mu times r p. This is what is called as a, a Stokes Einstein relation. Okay. This is a simple arguments of you know getting this equation, but uh, there are other ways of doing this. Okay. So, all that we did was we said that you know there is a particle is in motion and because of which there is going to be a, a drag force okay. and we said that this is basically Stokes drag because of the fact that the Reynolds numbers comes out to be much much less than 1 okay. and the energy associated with moving the particle is your drag force times the average displacement okay. and that has to come from the thermal energy just by equating that you will get a relationship between the diffusivity of the particles in the fluid and the thermal energy and this is some kind of a friction factor okay. okay people also write this as k b t divided by f okay, friction factor which is basically 6 pi mu r p yeah. yeah go ahead. Yes, why is it not the case? So, all that we are saying is you know I mean okay, so this is going to be um, I would say this is kind of more of an ideal idealized case right okay. and it turns out that you know of course, if you take uh, particles which could be rough for example, okay, if the particle is kind of set into rotation because of you know this bombardment in such cases you would have to worry about you know accounting those you know cases, but if you take like say uh, rigid uh, spheres, smooth spheres. Of, of course, there are some kind of assumptions, you know, where you can use this. But this is typically applied for rigid particles, okay. And the particles has to be have to be in colloidal size range, of course, because they have to exhibit Brownian motion. And of course, this is for a smoother surface and things like that, okay. Of course, you know, in real systems, you know, but it, it turns out that you know this kind of uh, this equation typically is valid for you know a lot of colloid that people use in you know every days you know experiments or life. So, yeah. yeah. Okay, so, now, now that we know that there is a relationship that exists between your diffusivity and you know k b t and, and the friction factor, uh, what someone called John Perrin okay, did was he basically did the very first experiments okay on quantifying brownian motion okay uh, this happened around 1920s okay and all he did was he basically had this video of the particles moving in a fluid okay and he tracked the particles so what i what he did is this is a, the you know the frame of the movie that i've got I have one particle here and what I do is at some if this is time t okay, I take at some time other time interval say t plus delta t I look at where the particle is. Okay. Now, I look at another frame say t plus 2 times delta t I look at where the particle is. Okay. So, so, in the end what he did was he basically came up with a picture of the location of particle as a function of time right. So, you know it was basically exhibiting some chaotic motion. So, all that he had was he had some information about the time frame okay. that is you know the distance you know he had information about what is the, the delta t between the two frame that he was considering and of course, he had tracked the particle that means, he had access to the particle position as a function of time. Okay. So, once he did that, so he calculated what is called as a, a mean square displacement okay. and that mean square displacement is given by something like this. Okay. All you have to do is if you have basically tracked you know the particle for a time t, okay. if you have observed it for enough time, so what you, what you did is you are x at time t i plus t minus x at time t i whole square plus y at t i plus t 
minus y at t i whole square okay, uh, right, divided by n is the, the mean square displacement. Okay, all that you do is you basically know the positions right? Okay, and if I have like say I have taken 10 frames, right? I know the distance it travels in every frame. Okay? So, that is your mean square displacement. Now, that the mean square displacement could be measured by experiment, what he did is he made use of the theory of, of Brownian motion that Einstein had developed, okay, which basically said that if you observe a particle for, for long enough time that is for t going to infinity, okay, your mean square displacement okay, goes as 6 times d t, where t is your observation time and d is the diffusivity of the particles. Okay. Now, because he was able to measure this, okay, Perrin was able to measure it, he can actually calculate what is diffusivity. Okay. Now, your Stokes Einstein relationship is k b t divided by 6 pi mu r p. Okay. Now, he was careful enough to pick particles of exactly same size, okay, because he had access to a, an electron microscope. He basically took particles which are about 0 0.53 micrometer in radius. He was able to work with well characterized particles, so he knew r p. Okay. And because he could do Brownian, Brownian motion experiments, he was able to calculate d that is known now. Okay. And of course, he used water as a fluid in which the particles were put. Okay. He knew the viscosity. From this, what he did is he calculated k b, okay, the Boltzmann constant. Okay. And we know that k Boltzmann constant is basically your universal gas constant divided by the Avogadro number. Okay. That is why that is how he was basically able to calculate what is the, the Avogadro number and the number that he got from his experiment as I said yesterday was very close to 6.023 into 10 power 23. Okay. So, this is yeah go ahead. Which one? The mean square displacement. So, uh, if you look at the video right. So, you had particles all the particles were kind of exhibiting some motion right now what i can do is i can actually go and pick one particle i can look at that particle as a function of time okay now in each frame i locate the same particle okay now so therefore what i can do is for every frame i can associate a location right which is basically your x comma y okay because you are looking at in two dimensions okay now, once I ha have access to the, the position of the particle okay, and if I know what is the time frame that I am basically considering from my the video, right? I can choose the hey I, I have a like say a video for say 5 minutes, I am going to look at every 5 seconds you know what is the location. So, if I have information I can basically back calculate what is the mean square displacement. Yeah. Okay, so, um, Yo, so, as I said right this is a useful equation so which you, you should remember um, you know and it is uh, kind of used in a lot of commercial instrument that people buy for measuring particle sizes. The basic equation that basically goes into the calculation of the sizes is this particular equation. Okay. They will have some way of measuring diffusivity. Okay. It could be done either you know if you use a microscope there will be some algorithm by which I can actually calculate the mean square displacement from which I can calculate d. Okay. I plug in that d here. Okay, and I can calculate you know r p which is the size of the particle right or there are other ways of getting d okay and there are some instruments where what people do is they measure if I have a particle in a fluid you shine a laser light okay because the particle is moving okay uh, you detect what is called as a scattered intensity okay and because of the chaotic motion of the particle the laser intensity also fluctuates okay and from that fluctuation there is another way of back calculating your d. Okay. So, no matter what the instrument is okay, whether you get d from the fluctuations of the scatter intensity or by using some kind of particle tracking in the end the size of the particle is basically determined by using uh, Stokes Einstein, Einstein relationship. Okay. So, uh, we will move on to the next topic which is phoresis. 
okay. In specific we are going to talk about something called as electrophoresis. Now, for electrophoresis, so what you do is, so all of you know, um, um, if you have, like, say, I have a cell. Say, if I have a, a cathode, for example, okay, and an anode, right? Now, if you have ions in solution, okay, if you have, like, say, positively charged ions or negatively charged ions in solution, like this is, say, this is going to be your, a fluid, right? Now we know that you know the moment you apply some kind of a voltage difference, right? A potential difference. We know that you know ions are going to move, right? Now, of course, you know the the positive charged ions are going to move towards the cathode, right? It's going to be moving this way, and negative charge is going to be if this is your negative and positive, right? So, negative ions is going to be moving in this direction, right? Now, so we know that the charged ions do move when you apply an electric field, right? Now, similarly, you can also consider a charged particle, okay. Say that you know I have a particle that is charged, okay. I can consider this as a, a macro ion, okay. So, now if I take Na, play, Na plus, right. So, the charge on that is your valency times E, right, where E is the fundamental elementary charge, right. So, in this case, for Na plus, that is equal to plus one times E, right? That's your the charge on Na plus. Okay. Now, if I have Ca two plus, is going to be two times E, right? Similarly, if I have a macro ion, say that you know there are some ten charges on the particle surface. Okay. Therefore, you know I can say that you know there is there are ten charges multiplied by E is going to be the charge on the particle. Okay. If that's that, that's say Q. Now. In electrophoresis, what is actually exploited is the fact that you know if you have similar to ions, the particles have to be charged for it to move in a potential you know that you apply, right. Now, let us think about how does the particle acquire charge. So, I have a particle okay, and that is charged. Any thoughts as to how the particles can be charged? Yeah, you have something to say? If you rub surfaces, you know the particles would get charged, right? I mean that you would have, you know, learnt in your, you know, 10 plus 2 or something like that. But that would happen, you know, that is because of fr friction, right? Now, if you have particles in solution, okay, now we are talking about particles that are dispersed in a fluid. Okay, and I would have, I would like to have them to be charged. There are different mechanisms by the, by which the particles can be charged. Okay, one is that if I have a particle, okay, now the chemistry is so advanced that I can actually graft the particle surface. Okay, I can actually put some charges on the particle surface. Okay, I can maybe make the surface functionalized with some charges. Now, whenever I have particle like that. The moment I put it in water, what will happen is this particle with you know this surface groups it gives C over minus okay. This mechanism of charging a particle is by what is called as a surface charge dissociation. Okay. You can buy particles like this. Okay. If you want particle with any functional groups, you can get them in the market. Okay. So, if I say, hey, I want a particle with the COOH groups on the surface, you can buy it. Okay. So, therefore, one of the ways by which the particles can acquire charge is that you know, you have a particle and there are some surface functionalization. This surface functionalization is done by putting some chemical molecules, right, molecules on the surface. The moment you put such particles in water, there is going to be some dissociation and that is going to leave a particle charge, okay. This is one mechanism. There are other mechanisms where if you have particles in a solution, 
if there are some ions in solution okay it could be h plus or oh minus or you know or na plus or whatever okay then what could happen is your ions can go and get adsorbed on the particle surface okay there could be a, a physical adsorption of ions on the particle surface okay so this is this mechanism is something called as adsorption of ions right it could be adsorption of ions it could be adsorption of any charge molecules it could be adsorption of charged surfactants it could be adsorption of charged polymers okay so now that we have a a charged particle okay and say that you know i'm going to apply a potential difference right it's going to move right just similar to the the ions that we talked about now if you apply an electric field e okay if you are applying electric field e the force the electrical force or you know the, the force with which the particles move in the applied field is given by the charge q times e okay so you've done this at some point right if you have you know coulomb's law right your force is q1 q2 by 4 pi r square right now if you want that's the force of attraction or repulsion between you know of course there's 4 pi epsilon naught epsilon r right sorry yeah right so okay that's your right now electric field is basically your force per unit charge right is q if you say q1 q2 instead of that if you have q square right so let's say i'm going to do that okay you have two charges uh, right so q divided by 4 pi epsilon naught epsilon r times r square you know that's that's your electric field right that's a definition of so the, the, that's how the force and the the field are related, right? All of you know this, right? Yes? No? So basically, the 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 way the you know the electric field is defined is it's basically force per unit charge. Okay. So therefore, if I'm if I'm saying that you know I'm applying an electric field E, okay, the force which which the the particles start moving either towards a, a positively charged electrode or a negatively charged electrode. Okay, is given by F E Q, which is Q times E, and as I said, Q is the charge that the particle carries. Okay, and we have been saying that you know I'm going to consider that this is a, a macro ion. So if I say that you know I have a particle surface with like say 10 charges, 10 dissociable groups. Okay, your Q is going to be 10 times E. Okay, but for in general you can call it as Q, which is the the charge that the the particle has. Right. Now, so of course the you know if you didn't apply the electric field, the particle was moving because of the the Brownian motion, right? Now that now that you applied a field, it's going to first it's going to accelerate, right? It's going to start moving faster towards one of the electrode, okay? And how fast it moves depends on the strength of the applied field, right? Of course, you know it cannot accelerate infinitely, right? because it is also going to feel the drag because of the presence of liquid is going to be slowed down right as it moves okay and ultimately it is going to start moving with some stationary or a constant velocity and that constant velocity is basically determined by the balance between F E L and your drag force, right? Right, because you know whenever you have a particle moving in the fluid, there's a drag force. Now, the drag force basically opposes the motion. Okay, ultimately, there's going to be an equilibrium, and after that initial acceleration, the particle slows down and it's going to start moving with a a constant velocity. Okay. 
Now, this F E L is Q times E okay, and F D is your 6 pi R p times you know mu times some velocity v right that is the velocity with which the particles would move right after that initial acceleration. Therefore, I can actually get what is v by e which is the velocity which with the particle is moving divided by the applied electric field that basically goes as q divided by 6 pi r p into mu right. Okay. This velocity velocity per unit field is something called as a is denoted by a quantity u which is called as electrophoretic mobility. Okay, so, the velocity which with the particle is moving per divided by the, the field that you apply okay, that velocity is what is called as electrophoretic mobility. And if you have a way of calculating what is the electrophoretic mobility, okay, you can if you know the, the parameters of the particle and the fluid that you are using, I can actually calculate what is Q that is the, the charge on the particle. Okay. Therefore, what people do is they pe people exploit this concept called electrophoresis. That means, the fact that I can put a I can set a charged particle into motion by applying electric field, I can exploit that to basically measure the charge of the particle. Okay. And uh, again the experiments are going to be very similar. Okay. What they do is they will construct a, a rectangular cell okay, that has two electrodes okay, an anode and a cathode. You put a, a dilute dispersion of particles. The reason why dilute dispersion of particle is important is because it turns out that <coughs> this expression that we wrote up right if f e l is equal to q times e is actually valid only under infinite dilution. That means, the number of ions that you should have in solution or the number of charged particles that you have in solution should be very very few. because if that is not the case, what is going to happen is if there are a lot of particles you know next to each other, okay, the motion of one is going to be influenced by the other as well, right. So, you would have to avoid that. Okay. So, this kind of formalism is valid only if you are working with a very dilute cases, okay, where the concentration of ions in your solution is very, very less, or if you want to talk about colloidal particles, the your the particles number of particles in your dispersion is going to be very, very few. Okay. Um, okay, so, and, the, and the, the experiment that is done is as I said you take a rectangular cell you put in two electrodes, okay, you put in a dilute dispersion, I can put this below a microscope, I apply a known um, electric field okay, that means, I know what I am applying I am basically I know what is the, the E that I am applying. Okay. Now, I am recording a video of how the, the particle is moving because I can track particles I can actually get what is the, the velocity which the particle is moving right. All I have to do is take different frames I locate their position and from that I can get the, what is the velocity with which the particle is moving. So, therefore, I have some way of calculating the electrophoretic mobility. Okay. Once I do that okay, um, if I know what is the if I have some other independent way of measuring the particle size either by you know some using the electron microscope or you know some other means. I know R p, if I know what is the, the fluid that I am using, okay, I can basically calculate what is the electrophoretic mobility. Again, this is again one of the very common techniques that everybody uses for measuring the charge on the particle.